Welcome back to the bench, everyone. I've got the airline back on here finally, or at least this half of it, mind you. Uh, the CRT chassis and the RF chassis have both been worked on fairly extensively. I got a little crazy one night and just started going through trying to get everything working. And then I wanted to show off what I have done. I thought about filming all of it and then realized how boring it actually is, even just sitting there editing all of that footage and making all kinds of random decision. So I'm going to flip this over. We'll take a look at what I've done to this. I'm very gentle. Uh, actually, you know what? I just forgot. I didn't put the screws in the high voltage cage. So let's take a look in there first. So while testing this, I lost high voltage for a while and I ran around chasing my tail trying to figure out what was wrong with it. At the end of the day, it turned out to be a fried 1B3 GT. Uh, this one, as a matter of fact, and, uh, yeah, that one was kind of screwed up. Heard some pops and clicks, and eventually I lost raster twice, actually. So with those out of the way, um, in my, my haste to try and figure out things, I replaced the 1,000 picofarad capacitor across the, uh, or the uh, high voltage coil there. And I also had to replace this, I believe it's an 84 or an 87 ohm resistor on the B plus connection going to this from the voltage doubler. Because a screw had actually gotten wedged between the chassis and this point right here and the excess current cooked that one a little bit too hard and it wound up going to twice its normal value. The red alligator clip right there is actually a connection from the uh, voltage doubler through the filter choke on this chassis before going to the electrolytic capacitors. Uh, I put this in there because I wanted to measure the B-plus current because the documentation for the Sentinel 400, which this is just the same thing in a different housing, uh, shows it made a modification of adding a quarter amp uh, fuse between these two points. And I wanted to see, as it was firing up, if I was exceeding a quarter of an amp. And I'm not. With uh, the 1B3 replaced and the new components in there, I am safely under that. So no harm, no foul. I just haven't repaired it. I am considering finding a single block fuse holder. I think I have one somewhere. And putting that in there. I'm pretty sure it was a fast blow. They did not specify a slow blow fuse. You have to excuse my cat back there being a little noisy. Uh, tucked up under here, however, the pair of selenium rectifiers has been replaced with a pair of 1 and 4007 high voltage diodes. And the original, uh, well I wouldn't say original, the resistor that was here was 7.5 ohms, the original was 10 ohms at 2 watts. Uh, I didn't have anything that low. I actually wound up increasing the value to 33 ohms after doing some reading. Uh, the selenium rectifier manufacturers typically uh, asked for a, a series resistance of around 22 ohms minimum. And they also stated that most selenium rectifiers in the 130 volt AC range, which is what the, the three that are in this set are, typically need a 22 ohm series resistor anyway. Or, sorry. In this range, they typically only drop about 5 volts overall, so 5 volts versus a tenth of a volt. And there's going to be a little bit of a difference there. I did notice that with the original resistor, the B-plus values were creeping up a little higher than I'd like, and especially on this capacitor right here, which is in the middle of the voltage doubler circuit, was getting a little too close to 160 volts, which is its max rating, uh, without even being at full line voltage. So that was pretty telling that if I cranked it to full line voltage, there was a good chance I would stress this cap out. So I'll put this in there. That brought that down to an acceptable level, and now the voltages at the sockets are more in line with what they should be. After the voltage doubler on the sockets, I should see about 250 volts DC, which I am, so that's good. Uh, I don't think I actually wound up doing anything else. I think I did. I replaced that resistor there. Big whoop. Nothing crazy. And I think... That was about it. Yes, yeah, so that's about it for this chassis. So I'll take this and set it aside for a moment. And we'll take a look at what I have done to its companion, the RF chassis. 
For one thing, I scoured through my collection of tubes and I managed to fully populate this thing, which I'm really happy with. I looked through and I actually found a, uh, the correct output tube for the speaker, which is a 6AS5. Oh wait, no, sorry, I robbed this from a different set, and I have an Admiral that just came in that I uh, borrowed a few things from. Got everything in there. Uh, I just started looking through my selection of tube shields and putting one on everything I could. These two here, though, the solder blobs at the base, are preventing me from using those split style of tube, so or tube shields, and I don't have enough of these to go around, just the ones that came with the set, so... I shielded what I could, the 6 EG5 and whatever the heck this is on the front end are not shielded. I did manage to shield, what I believe it's the converter tube? Maybe that's the 6 EG, well, whatever. I shielded the front, the front end of things. So that's all for the top. And if we flip it over... I'm going to try and get this in frame well enough. More importantly, uh... What do we have that's new? Well, obviously quite a few things. So for one, down here, this wonderful terminal strip that I have installed just above the can dome resistor is for the three electrolytics that occupy this can right here, the tallest can on the outside. It's a little cramped. Uh, it looked a lot better in my head, I'll be honest. Selenium rectifier is gone, replaced by a 1 in 4007. The resistor that comes right after it, I actually bumped up uh, to 50 ohms to compensate for the drop di uh, difference, and that seems to have worked pretty well too. Uh, that is a that's a 10 watt because that's again all I had on hand, uh, but all new Nishikon capacitors. And now these are all rated at 160 volts because uh, this only has a single uh, single diode coming off of 100. And 17 volt tap? Yeah, 117 volt uh, non-center non tapped winding. That's all working great. Got all the other capacitors here replaced. All the little cathode bypass guys and such have been replaced with absolutely teeny tiny versions. Not a whole lot else. I have considered going back in here. There's a number of mica capacitors, or supposedly mica capacitors, that are part of the sync separator circuit, which I believe are... Where are they? Oh, they're in the other chassis, that's why I can't find them here. In the other chassis, there's some sync separator caps that I'm considering putting new silver micas in, uh, just for stability's sake. So that's all nice and new. Now, I have fired this up and played it. I'm afraid I didn't record that, but I was while tracking down the issue with the lack of high voltage and such, I just kept trying to get it working until it did eventually work. So I've got the VCR brought out here. Only problem is, shortly after getting it working and getting the image somewhat stable, I haven't done any alignment or anything to this. Uh, that's going to be a whole project in and of itself, just because of the age is set and the test equipment that that entails. Let me bring the two chassis over, and if we're lucky, let's see if we actually get a picture. The last time I fired this up, I let it play for several minutes. I don't remember exactly how long. But after a while, I just lost brightness. The raster didn't collapse. The image didn't collapse. It just slowly faded away. Which, uh, to me, means one of two things, either the brightness control, uh, the circuit for the control grid has uh, decided to die, which I would think would be a sudden thing, or the worst possibility is the filament in the CRT went open, and what I was seeing was the last few electrons coming off of the cathode before it pooped out entirely. Really hoping that's not the case, but I do have an extra 7JP4 that's not here, but I have an extra, one or two. That being said, let me get this hooked up to the Variac. And get the VCR kicked back on, it doesn't matter. I have a Balin and some alligator clips here because this is a very high class setup I'm going for. 
You can't tell, this is all very last minute. I would like to replace this antenna twin lead. It is melted in a few places and kind of, well, actually, no, these are staple holes. It's been a little brutalized. I'd like to put a newer ish one on it. I used to salvage them from uh, rabbit ear antennas, those cheap ones you'd get to stick on the top of plastic CRT televisions. Okay. So, B plus is on. I'm going to turn off the overheads because with them on, you will not see anything even at maximum brightness. So, there we go. And let's see what blows up. That's at about 90 volts, which is typically about where I start getting a raster. Yep, there it is. It's a little wobbly. Hasn't gotten up to full voltage yet. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and hit play here. Assuming that my VCR is on. Hmm, is it going to make a fool out of me? Pretty sure I've got it on the right channel, too. No, I'm trying to bring this up to proper line voltage. going on. Can I fast forward through this junk? So I'm not getting anything, which is a little disconcerting. Nothing out of the audio circuit either. Okay, 6AS5 says everything's okay there. To gently bring this up to about 110 on the Variac. Let me know if you smell smoke. And I can most certainly hear the RF section uh, doing its thing. Hmm. Alright, I think we need to change the channel. There's my twin lead metal thing. It looks okay. Whoop, hold it. Ah! It looks like we may have an issue with dirty contacts. I never actually went into the tuner. Yeah, there's our issue. This thing's got some gnarly contacts. Come on. Audio, maybe? Hmm. Just go through the rest of the channels and see if there's anything else on. Nope. It's more bizarre is that I'm not getting any audio out of it. So obviously the image is there, the signal is through, and I was getting audio that was okay. Last time I did this. No, oh, that's warm. That's okay. Oop. Hold it. We got some problems with the socket on that tube there. So there's one spot that I can hold it in that's a little better than others. But it's having issues locking. Also, the vertical retrace or the uh, retrace lines are a little extreme. What's uh, going on back here? Anything dark? No, tubes are lit up. So why then did I lose the audio? Oh, dirty contacts underneath the six AS five. 
have changed his safety. Long before safety was an issue, beetles were noted for an exceptional toughness. I apologize that the image is sideways, but that's how the chassis sits in this thing, so the image has got to be canted. Uh, I have to figure out the correct angle. In fact, Prevention Magazine selected the Volkswagen for its import safe car award in 1992. In safety studies, such as these by the highway... Okay, well you get the idea. So, it looks like my problem is actually the result of bad contacts in the sockets, so I'm going to have to go through and clean those. But that's good. That means that nothing else has fried. I was really afraid that the tube filaments had pooped out, which would have been really, really disappointing. Uh, anyway, great. Will be the heart of a contemporary. Well, I think that about does it for this video. There's not much more that I wanted to accomplish. So, uh, hopefully in the next one I will drag out some dusty test equipment. We'll see about getting it working so that I can try to get this thing aligned a little better. I'm not going to try fiddling with the IS or the screwdriver and just doing it by ear. These are supposed to be uh, done with a sweep generator and a marker generator and an oscilloscope. And, yeah, slightly more complicated than an AM Superhead. So, next time, test equipment. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching.